I guess to explain it, it's cool to make a fully physical simulated skateboard, but trying to put an actual human skater on that is really, really hard and they kind of look ridiculous. What I mean is that if you look at a game like Tony Hawk, the way Tony Hawk Pro Skating works is, physically speaking, what you're looking at is a pill. Everything else is fake. In our game, the only thing that's real is the skateboard. And I wanted to put a bird on it. It may not be obvious from the game or anything else. I like birds, and that's not just uh, an affectation. I spend most mornings actually sitting and watching the birds in front of the house. That We have this little setup where the chairs are looking out onto the uh, patio, and there's a ton of bird feeders and bird seed out there. I've done a lot of work in cultivating a good environment for birds, and a lot of the game is actively inspired by the birds in our neighborhood. We're trying to embrace the concept of skateboarding birds in a genuine fashion. Our birds are birds. Our birds are absurd, and they're doing kind of, maybe that's not realistic exactly. By avoiding that, we've kind of found this niche that really works and it's cute. It has a texture. You know how it would sound if you scrape it with your fingernail, you, know, you might know what it smells like. You know how this feels, you know how this sounds, you know how it smells. Just kind of ground of the experience. Mostly I'm hoping that players take away from this maybe their first introduction to skate culture, and I'm hoping it's a positive one, and that maybe it encourages them to dig deeper. My real-world experience with skating is kind of sad because, again, I'm a nerd. I've always been a nerd. Uh, when I was a kid, I was playing the Tony Hawk games, all of them. And then when I was an adult, I was playing the skate games, all of them. And I was not athletic until my mid-twenties, maybe? So before that, I just didn't go near skate parks because either I would have broken my ass if I tried to get on one, or because skate parks were where cool kids hang out, and if I had gone there, I would have gotten rocked and wouldn't have been great. So Tony Hawk was my exposure to skate culture, which I thought was super cool, and it led me to music and all kinds of neat things, and punk culture, and so on and so forth. Like, this was this window to this whole other world that there would be, he was never going to get to experience. In virtually every sport, you will get a passionate argument when you raise the subject of who is the best ever. You will not get that argument in skateboarding. If you go way, way back, I bet my grandpa when I was six years old that I would make games for a living, and he said, oh, 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 and I should have put money on the bet. <laughs> I got my first job working on a startup you've never heard of on a game called Eidolon, which went nowhere, but I did some really cool graphical stuff. And then that led to LEGO Universe picking me up, where I was, uh, by the end, a senior graphics programmer. And then after that, I set up a home office, and I've been remote ever since. When I set up Glass Bottom Games, my assumption was that things were moving in a digital direction, and I knew that if I was a purely virtual team, I would have an easier time working with remote people. And working with people from radically different walks of life is one of my favorite things about working remotely like this. So technically, our first game with uh, Glass Bottom Games would have been Asha. It was a side-scrolling game, but your side-scrolling path kind of moved through space. Uh, if you know what Hot Tin Roof is, we later revisited this same tech in a totally different engine. But at that point, Asha was in UDK, so that era. And after that, there was a Kickstarter for Gravitas, and it was a um, zero-g racer, if I say that, you probably know what I'm talking about. And unfortunately, the Kickstarter didn't fund, and after that, it was just like, I, we're out of money. And then it was just me. And then when it was just me, the reason we made Jones on Fire was because it was just me, and I had to figure out what game I could make without anyone, anyone's help. And that started at a jam, a uh, game jam called Blaze Jam, and Colorado wildfire season was really bad that year, and the Blaze Jam was there to benefit, um, you know, trying to get money for helping people out. And then our next game was Hot, or Hot Tin Roof, the Cat that Wore the Fedora. After Hot Tin Roof, we started working on a first-person puncher, which was called Spartan Fist. And then after that, at some point, it suddenly showed me a gif of a skateboarding bird like actual, literal skateboarding birds, you can teach them to skateboard. I saw that, and at the time, another friend, uh, Kevkev, Dirk Kevin on Twitter, had been working on a prototype for a skateboarding game. 
And the gimmick was that it was fully physical, fully simulated. The problem he was having was it's cool to make a fully physical simulated skateboard, but trying to put an actual human skater on that is really, really hard and they kind of look ridiculous. So I went to him because he was, uh, he had this code base that he wasn't sure what to do with. He was like, oh, does anyone want this? So I said, hey, what if I borrowed it and I put a bird on it? And he was game, so I took it. So in terms of realistic skaters, what makes a good skating game is number one, realistic simulation above skateboarding. So that whenever you do a kickflip, it's an actual kickflip. It has the limitations of doing a kickflip. What tricks you can move into after doing the kickflip are limited based on stance and where you did it and where you are in midair and so on and so forth. All of this stuff plays into the the feel of how accurate this is, of how true to life this is, which is important because all of this time you're kind of building this mental model of how you can skate in this world, which is based on how you can skate in the real world. Whereas in arcade games, in a Tony Hawk style skating, flow is especially important in the Tony Hawk games because you get into such high speed uh, movements <laughs> that there's really very, very little time to make choices about what you're going to do next. It just all needs to flow together and feel like this cool high speed maneuver. That's this big swoopy motion closer to flying than anything else. Skatebird is kind of sort of in the midpoint so we're focusing more on the expressivity and the at least making a nod towards realistic skating that skate is. But we're trying to keep the uh, controls simpler, uh, more akin to Tony Hawk. Whereas if I wanted to do an ollie in uh, skate, it wasn't just a button. It was I flick the stick down, I flick the stick up. And the way I flick the stick up is what dictates what kind of flip trick I do or if I do a flip trick at all. What we're trying to do with a skateboard is we're trying to, while respecting skateboarding, what we're trying to be more is allowing you to be expressive and less hardcore, basically. So we want you to be able to do that initial sequence without too much difficulty. We want you to struggle with and have more fun with the higher end stuff that, again, Tony Hawk is more what focuses on. Really big air or really big rhymes or really fun, large, obviously expressive movements that aren't strictly realistic, but are just barely within the realms of real. And that's why the environments are what they are. So if you have an actual bird that's doing actual skateboarding, if you look at GIFs of this, the only things that exist at bird scale tend to be tech deck toys, at tech deck being fingerboards. Anything else is gonna be something you have to make yourself because, well, I mean, they're, they're bird sized. And you're, if you're gonna do that, you're probably a crafty person, which means you're gonna make it out of cardboard, you're gonna make it out of pencils, you're gonna make it out of pens, all those little things that you happen to have around your workspace that you can build. And that's kind of where the aesthetic builds from, where it grows from. So the aesthetic is informed by the fact that we're trying to be genuine about skateboarding birds as like an actual thing as opposed to cartoons. By avoiding that, we've kind of found this niche that really works and it's cute and it's it has a texture. Cardboard is one of those visceral things that you just know. You know how this feels, you know how this sounds, you know how it smells. Just kind of ground of the experience. So I spent six months polishing that, turning it into something that at least looked sort of like a game. So we announced it. And it went really well. Like the announce went super better than anything else I've ever done. So that was exciting. And by this point, our team was, so after Spartan Fist, pretty much everyone left. And it was mostly just me again, except for Nathan Madsen, because he's been working with me essentially forever, which is really cool because Nathan is an amazing composer. <laughs> One of the things that Megan did from the very beginning with working with us was she didn't want to just do the, the plain Jane, the normal cookie cutter type of approach. Megan calls me and says, hey, um, I've got an idea. I've got a prototype. I've got this bird on a skateboard. I think about calling it Skatebird. What do you think? And I was like, sure, <laughs> why not? You know, we'll see what happens. Our game is, again, we're not making a hardcore skating game. We're making a more casual skating game. It's very likely to be people's first skating game. And we're trying to go for cozy philosophy. That means our music needs to be something you can sink into and relax to and just sandbox skate to. What happens to fit well with that is the whole lo-fi beats to study to or all of those channels that exist that are in that same genre now. We didn't want to emulate something that came before. I mean, obviously there are certain things that are going to be transferable. Some of the controls have been compared to Tony Hawk and some of the aesthetics and just the overall vibe, but we still wanted to have that unique identity that we seem to do with all of our games at Class Bottom Games. So when talking with Megan about what should the music sound like, very, very early on, we both agreed strongly that we are not going to go with the grunge or punk or 
just rock aesthetic that you have of Tony Hawk. Because although we admire those games and we want to pay an homage to them, we still want to do it with our own spin and our own unique vibe that we have. So then it became, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? We started looking into the idea of just grooves and fun kind of laid back, chill approaches. Instead of the high octane, instead of just like, hey, just do your best. I mean, even what the game talks about, a game about trying your best. So then we started going with some lo-fi stuff mixed with some hip-hop, jazz, those type of deals. Early on is I would just write little themes and give her the previews and she would see, okay, this is too clean, this is too produced, this is whatever. And we just kept doing some R&D. Once I hit on this thing where, like when a tape gets old and how the material will go up and down in its pitch and sometimes even in its speed, it's not super polished. It has a little bit of that hiss and that grit to it. When I found some samples and plugins and was making some stuff of my own that way, I remember Megan wrote me back an email. I was like, yes, yes, this is it. And then uh, we combined that. It was her idea again. She was like, what if we do some public domain voiceovers, like about bird documentaries? It's like, perfect. And so we started scouring those. I would sample them, work them in. We very specifically tried to avoid channeling what skate music was in the 90s because this is a game for people now. And what skate music is now isn't like punk anymore. So instead of punk, we wanted to go for something that was more speaking to current times, which meant hip hop. That genre is more what you hear, especially in kids' skate movies. Like if you look at kids that went to Woodward and the videos they're putting together now, these are more the kinds of music you're hearing in those tracks, actual hip hop, but also a lot of uh, SoundCloud rap and lesser known stuff and stuff that either doesn't have vocals or is less focused on rap and more focused on um, R&B. So accordingly, we have built our music more towards that. It just became sort of an organic idea. I think by not trying to emulate or copy Tony Hawk or Skate or some of those other IPs, it allowed us to st stand in our own little unique bubble and so it's been a lot of fun just playing in this world so we did the announce and that went really well and we rolled around to the kickstarter which would have been in early well not early early to mid 2019 We did the Kickstarter, and as part of that Kickstarter, we were in the Kind of Funny E3 Gaming Showcase, which was the moment at which everything pretty much exploded. And we were getting compared to, like, Cyberpunk 2077. And it kind of snowballed from there, and if you look at our Steam wishlisting whatever spike, it goes like crazy at that point. I have, of course, done this three times now. The first one was Gravitas, which was this failed Kickstarter I did before anyone really knew who we were. And then there was Hot and Roof, which funded just barely. Like, it did overfund a little bit, but not in terms you care about today. Like, it was, I think, a 20,000 goal, and we made 25. So cool for small indie, but not really big. And then there was Skatebird. Skatebird being my third Kickstarter was a lot easier to plan. I knew the things to avoid. I knew to avoid goofy physical rewards. I knew to put the physical rewards up really high. I knew to avoid offering to sign every single thing. And it made it a lot easier. And then we just started seeing reactions to how people were you know, viewing it and getting excited about it and building buzz. It's been incredible. And it overfunded and did so much better than the previous ones. We ran out of goals, like we got all of our stretch goals. Depending on how you measure it, it's the largest game I've worked on period, including LEGO Universe. LEGO Universe could be beaten in about eight hours. So Skatebird is, depending on how you measure it, longer than LEGO Universe, and it's possible we will sell more copies. One of the other mechanics that we added since the early days was Story Mode. Now, this was one of those things that people likely assumed was going to be in since the Kickstarter, even though like we were clear that at the start of the Kickstarter, if this doesn't happen, it's not going to be there. But mid-Kickstarter was also when we signed the Game Pass deal. Once we had all of that worked out, then we could actually bring more people on the team. And one of those people was Salivate. So I'll tell you this. I have been on a skateboard. 
I have pushed the skateboard. I have attempted to do things with the skateboard. What happened next, uh, the marks are still on my body, but I am not on a board anymore. When I learned that Skatebird would be a thing, I was one of the very first people to learn about Skatebird. Uh, when I learned that Skatebird would be a thing, I very quickly knew I wanted to be a part of it. Uh, a large piece of my career has been taking the absurd and making it meaningful. Seeing this, the potential to tell a similar absurd, meaningful story with birds on skateboards and Skatebird, I was very early like, hey, hey, what do you when you're going to be doing story eventually. So bring, bring me on for the story, bring me on for the story, bring me on for the story. So it's like, oh my God, we can work on this. It's going to be great. And it's goofy and it fits his vibe well and it fits my vibe well and we're working really well together. And after months of, once I had joined the team, trying to find some strange, clever context to allow us to pull off a meaningful story mode on an independent budget. When we asked that question, a light bulb sort of went off and we tried some tests and it was like, oh, actually it would be cheaper and funnier and far better if we just made it a actual piece of the game. So now uh, the original context for the story uh, has changed and you've got a story mode in an independent game on a much smaller budget than you would expect. And that's kind of the story mode we're building into. And as again, as we've moved in this direction, we've also found that people are resonating more with the concept. So again, we've, because we've had the time to figure this stuff out, the game's going to be a lot better than it probably would have been at first. I'm really glad I got to see Skatebird from early days and I pestered Megan to bring me onto the team eventually because now I'm working on one of my favorite things that I've ever seen, let alone uh, had the opportunity to work on. In the days and weeks ahead, we expect to see the number of cases climb even higher. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. The devastating and deepening impact on business pushed the markets down again today. The downtown because we had built our team remotely since the beginning and had planned on remote kind of being the future, we ended up being one of the studios that was essentially, well, I don't want to say unaffected because we're human beings and we're all affected in those terms, but like mechanically speaking, in terms of structure, COVID didn't influence us much because we were already all remote. Almost all of us already had multiple sources of income because I work with freelancers and all of them have other jobs. I don't think I'm anyone's primary gig. Generally speaking, everyone was okay in those terms. Where it hit us, as you would guess, is more in emotional kind of terms because everyone I work with is a human and I manage a team of a lot of people and I have to work around whatever things are stressing them out. Like I can't say, oh, well, this is important to you. Like, no, the whole world is melting down. You have to be okay with that. You have to work around and with people who are having the worst day of their lives. You have to be okay with that as a manager. You have to give them the space or the support or whatever it is they need. And I went through our, our numbers and I was like, okay, I have this amount in savings and I think I can extend you this amount in rev share even though we haven't actually sold anything yet. And I can just kind of debit it against the guaranteed rev share because the Game Pass deal means we're going to make at least this much at launch and I can help you this way if you need to because I understand that all of us maybe just lost our jobs or whatever that our day jobs were. And like I, I, all of that stuff and management took time and you kind of have to do it because being a decent human being involves this. You come together in a crisis. It hasn't influenced us in like hardcore game development. The game is going to get canceled terms. We just worked around it and moved on because we were already virtual, already relatively stable and in one of the better positions probably in the world to actually keep going despite this. So the fact that, yes, we've had to delay, but nothing has gotten critically screwed up, and by delaying, we're actually able to add more features. And the, yeah, we're in, we're in a good position in a terrible situation. Moving to digital conferences hasn't harmed us in the way I would have expected. And I don't know if that means if COVID ever ends, if we don't bother doing physical conventions anymore. Like, there's still a... a vibe that you don't get the same way and it still makes it still 
it's still fun to do in-person events. But at the same time, the digital events mean that instead of whoever can get to uh, Seattle or Texas, you can like do it worldwide and someone in rural Russia can play your game. Folks that would take two, three, four thousand US dollars to get to VAX who are just not going to come here for that reason can still play the game, can still experience it, can still be part of the vibe and vice versa. I think digital events are, are here to stay because yeah, we've been able to maintain uh, a surprising amount of press inertia. So with the final release of Skatebird, in terms of what I'm hoping players take away from it or what I'm hoping that they experience with it, um, like I've mentioned a couple times, I'm pretty sure this will be a lot of players' first skate game. And because we're in a more casual space, it's likely that this will be one of their first encounters with skate culture. What I'm hoping players take away from this is maybe they're unable to skate for whatever reason. Maybe it's due to physical disability. Maybe it's due to thinking they're going to break themselves in half. Maybe they missed that chance or whatever. Like there's a ton of reasons why they haven't picked up a skateboard. I'm hoping that this will give them one tiny shred of that experience that maybe they weren't having before. One of the things I'm most excited about players experiencing skateboard is when they're going to just share the little tricks that they do. And especially in this climate right now with COVID and all the things that are going on, having a little levity, a little bit of you know, comical relief is soothing to so many people. I don't know what the rest of the team will say, but the number one thing I want people to take away from Skatebird is the idea of sincerity and failure. There's a lot of games about being a hero. There's a lot of games about being the best, but a game that is very simply and very clearly about good people or good birds being the best versions of themselves that they can be and continuing to discover the best versions of themselves is really important to me. It's how I've grown as a creator. It's the type of person I want to be and the type of influence I want to bring into the world. So when people come into Skatebird, I hope that in seeing the birds try their best and do things that no one ever expected them to do and they never really should have been able to do. I hope they apply that to their own life and realize how incredible they are and how free they are to be whoever they can be.